Why does Kate have misgivings about the survey? She wonders whether her research is not just an alibi and whether Russ Kingman has not already made up his mind about the launching of the new product. Chapter 18 Relaxing in San Antonio Kate and Carlos Garcia, a fellow NBA student from Austin, are sitting at a table outside a bar along by the Riverwalk in San Antonio. Kate is sipping a margarita, and Carlos, a bottle of the local beer. Ah, Carlos, I think I'm falling in love with San Antonio. I've always loved it, but then I'm biased. I grew up here. I've always loved sitting out here in the evening on the river walk. It is beautiful. Thanks for taking me to visit the Alamo, by the way. I'd wanted to see it since I first arrived. My pleasure. Thank you for coming. So, Kate, are you going to tell me about your trip to Philadelphia yesterday? Of course. It was a great trip, the first time I've been to the US headquarters. I was really impressed. And you'll never believe who spent about an hour speaking with me. I don't know, Kate. The president? The CEO? Not quite. The vice president for marketing and sales. A guy named Russ Kingman. Wow, that's really awesome. And what did this VP have to say to you? That he decided to put me in charge of the market research for the new product I mentioned, aimed at the Hispanic population. But you couldn't tell me what that product was. Okay, Carlos, I'll tell you, but you must realize it's confidential. You can trust me, Kate. It's a pecan praline bar, which would be manufactured in San Antonio to start with. But if it's successful, they'd make it at the San Diego plant too. Logical. Southern California is full of Hispanics, too. But why did they choose you? I mean, I know you're very talented. But you're young, not very experienced. And you'll be busy with your MBA. I think the MBA is the key factor. Russ Kingman said that it was a remarkable opportunity to gain the expertise of, I quote, some of the top marketing faculty in the country. Free of charge. And, of course, you also have privileged access to the Hispanic population. Do I really? What about you? Have you got your professional project sorted out yet? Not finalized, but I have several leads I'm working on but it will definitely be in the area of corporate finance. That was the reason I chose Austin. The Department of Finance has some brilliant faculty, too. I'm sure it does. You know, we're sort of complementary when you think about it. Complementary? <laughs> well, you in finance, me in marketing. We'd make a good team. Well, as I said, I can offer you privileged access to the Hispanic population. When are you going to come and have dinner with my folks? When are you inviting me? What about next weekend? We don't have to be in Austin. 
That sounds fine to me. Comprehension. What are Kate and Carlos doing during this conversation? During this conversation, Kate and Carlos are sitting at a table outside a bar, having drinks. What does Carlos say about San Antonio? Carlos says he's always loved San Antonio. Of course, he's biased because he grew up there. Where had Kate and Carlos probably been before coming to the bar? Prior to this conversation, they'd probably visited the Alamo because Kate thanks Carlos for taking her there. What has Kate not told Carlos so far? So far, Kate has not told Carlos about her visit to United Chocolates American headquarters in Philadelphia. Who took time for about an hour to speak to Kate during her visit to United Chocolates U.S. headquarters? Russ Kingman, UC's Vice President Marketing and Sales, spoke to Kate for about an hour. What was the conversation about? The conversation concerned the market research for the new product aimed at the Hispanic population. Russ Kingman has decided to put Kate in charge of it. Where will UC's new product be manufactured? UC's new product will be manufactured in San Antonio to start with, but if it's successful, it will also be produced at their San Diego plant. Why does Kate believe she was chosen for this mission despite her age and lack of experience? Because she is going to use the new product as the basis for her MBA professional project. Russ Kingman thinks that United Chocolate will thus be able to take advantage of the expertise of the Austin marketing faculty, whom he considers to be among the best in the country. What will be the subject of Carlos's professional project? He hasn't finalized the subject of his professional project yet, but it will be in the area of corporate finance. When does Kate agree to have dinner with Carlos's folks? Kate agrees to have dinner with Carlos's family the following weekend. Chapter 19 From Theory to Practice Mary Ann, a friendly anthropology student from Australia, is sitting next to Kate in the library. Unlike Kate, she doesn't use the computer much for her studies. She starts chatting with her. Kate! We've been working for hours. We've become workaholics. Really? I haven't seen the time go by. American libraries are so pleasant to work in that I don't even feel I'm working. They're open every day until midnight. Access to books is unrestricted. Hmm. Don't you think it's time for a cuppa and a smoko? I don't smoke, but I could do with a cup of tea. As a matter of fact, it will have to be a cup of iced tea. Have you forgotten this is sunny Texas, not Mother England? You're right. I'll end up believing I'm overworked. Are you satisfied with the progress of your report, Kate? Yes. I'm really doing good work with my portable computer. You're really into computers, a real nerd, aren't you? 
my portable computer's possibilities are simply fantastic. It's amazing how quickly it can capture, store and retrieve masses of information. I'm so relieved it takes care of tedious, repetitive tasks. That you wouldn't want to do. That goes without saying. You know, my computer is so good at crunching numbers. I collected a lot of data and stored them in a database. Then I analysed all the information using the statistics and models available. When I think I was such a poor mathematics student, it makes me laugh. Laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> so you used your computer to process your questionnaires? All the time. I can very well picture you toying with spreadsheets, printing nice coloured pie charts and bar graphs. Don't assume I'm getting carried away. I have no time for that. Besides, Russ, my boss, warned me against too many statistics. Stick to the major findings is the watchword. How did you organise your work? First, I had to define the problem and set my research objective. Then I figured out a plan for collecting data from primary and secondary sources. Afterwards, I just had to collect, process and analyse the information. In other words, all you have to do is write the end on your report. No, I still have to interpret and report the findings. But of course, my brainless computer cannot do that for me. Nevertheless, you can't live without your laptop, mate. It's so convenient that it's a pleasure to work with it. It's hardly any bigger than a notepad, and I can take it anywhere. I use it in the library, on the train, at home. Just what I was thinking. You've become a computerholic. Soon you won't be able to tell the difference between work and leisure. Never fear. Comprehension Why does Kate like working in American libraries? She likes working in American libraries because they are pleasant, they have long opening hours and they offer a lot of freedom. What shows that Mary Ann is not so hard-working as Kate? She feels like taking a break. Why has Kate made so much progress with her report? She has made so much progress because she has used her portable computer very efficiently. In what way did Kate's computer help her in the drafting of her report? It captured, stored and retrieved the mass of information she had collected. How did Kate cope with the tedious parts of her study? The computer helped her by performing tedious, repetitive tasks like crunching numbers, calculating statistics, etc. What makes Kate laugh? She laughs at the thought that she was bad at mathematics. What wrong assumption does Mary Ann make? She assumes that Kate is wasting time playing with her computer. What approach did Russ recommend to Kate? He told Kate to stick to the main findings and not to use too many statistics. What advantages does a laptop present? A laptop is very convenient because it is small and it can be used practically anywhere. According to Mary Ann, 
What risks do computer users run? A computer user runs the risk of no longer being able to distinguish between work and leisure. Chapter 20 Cultural Differences On Saturday afternoon, Kate goes to watch the basketball game between UC's team and Compute X, another corporate team from San Antonio. During the interval between the third and fourth period, she chats with Jamie Maldonado, the company's foreman. Do you enjoy watching basketball, Kate? You bet. The legendary players of San Antonio Spurs have given a global impact to this game. Is basketball popular in South America? You would be surprised by the reach of this game. It is now being played in big cities, small towns, and increasingly in rural areas. I didn't realize that. Chances are, if you give someone a basketball in the most remote areas of Latin America, they will know what to do with it. I thought everyone played soccer there. Soccer is undoubtedly the number one sport, but after that, you find basketball as the next favorite sport. By the way, are you happy to live in San Antonio? I'm getting used to it, as you must have done in your time. I understand you immigrated from Ecuador ten years ago. Oh, yes. I remember I didn't speak much English then, and I found it hard to adjust to the American way of life at the beginning. Sure, but Americans are quite informal and hospitable, I find them very helpful. They were hospitable to me, all right, but they soon disappeared, leaving me on my own. I see. You expected them to take you by the hand. In a way. And I found it hard to adjust to the fast pace of life. I feel Americans work fast, but in a relaxed way. What else did you find it hard to adjust to? What I found hardest to learn was not to trifle with schedules and deadlines. Indeed. Here you soon learn that time is money. And Americans don't waste time with small talk. They go straight to the point. To be sure, here there's no beating about the bush. People aren't very tolerant of many different things happening at once. They object to being interrupted by telephone calls or people dropping in with questions. Right. In Ecuador, our attitude to time is more flexible because we live much more in the present. And whenever possible, we avoid being tied down to specific dates in the future. It has taken me quite some time to understand the way of doing things here. You've got to admit that in San Antonio, people are very straightforward. When an outsider doesn't have a clue about something, it is his responsibility to ask for explanations. People would be glad to answer. And what I found very hard to accept at first was the fact that family and friends hardly ever influence decisions. In South America, people act quite differently. We are Latins. Come to think of it, I realize there is a lot of wisdom in the old saying, business and friendship don't mix. Oh, the game's starting up again. Look, Johnny has just made a three-point basket. Isn't that wonderful? Comprehension
Why has basketball become popular all over the world? Basketball has acquired worldwide fame thanks to excellent teams like the San Antonio Spurs. Has basketball become the most popular sport in South America? No. Basketball ranks second behind soccer, European football. What adjustment difficulties did Jamie encounter at the beginning of his stay in the USA? At the beginning, he spoke little English and had difficulty coping with the American way of life. According to Kate, how do Americans behave with strangers? Americans are unaffected. They have a genuine sense of hospitality and they help strangers. When he arrived in the USA, what did Jamie expect of Americans? He expected Americans to take him by the hand. What do Americans value in a worker's performance? They like a worker to be punctual in his or her assignments. What different South American conception of time does Kate allude to? In South America, people have a more casual approach to time. Schedules and deadlines are not always met, and tasks may be postponed. How much time do Americans devote to the preliminaries of a negotiation? Americans devote as little time as possible to preliminaries. What role do family and friends play in American business deals? Family and friends exert practically no influence on business decisions. Chapter 21 Preparing a Presentation Three months after beginning her market survey, Kate is almost ready to present it to the management of United Chocolate. She is discussing it with her friend, Carlos. Are you ready for your presentation, Kate? I hope so. I definitely want to make a good impression on the management of United Chocolate. I don't need to remind you that the key to success is good preparation. Do you have a clear idea of what you want to say? Have you organized your points? I feel I have a pretty good grasp of the subject. After all, I worked hard on this market survey. I started by brainstorming my ideas, and then I selected the most relevant and appropriate ones. Right. You don't want to cram too much into your presentation. And I've spent a lot of time structuring it. A good rule of thumb is to tell your public what you're going to say, say it, and then tell your public what you have said. I'm not afraid of repeating myself. I'll focus on developing some key points in an interesting and persuasive way. Right. Bear in mind that your presentation should have a clear, coherent structure and cover the points you want to make in a logical order. I've outlined the structure of my presentation and I'll draw on relevant examples and figures to illustrate the main points. Visual aids in the form of charts, diagrams, graphs can make your presentation more interesting and easier to understand. But don't try to put too much information on your slides. I know, when a PowerPoint presentation is too dense, people have a tendency to watch it rather than listen to what the speaker is saying.
I'll keep my slides as simple as possible. I want them to underline what I'm saying without distracting attention. Believe me, I've worked on that. Good. I have even thought of including one or two anecdotes for additional variety and humour. Russ Kingman, my boss, has quite a sense of humour. I'm glad to hear it. I should also tell you that I've noticed you tend to speak too fast when you're under stress. Pay attention to that and stick to the vocabulary you're familiar with. I know I'll be nervous at the beginning, at least. Just don't talk too fast when you begin your presentation. Allow some time to establish a rapport with your audience. First impressions are very important, but I'm sure your enthusiasm and your interest in the subject, not to mention your beautiful accent, will win your public over. I already feel more confident, but you know, practice makes perfect. I would really like to practice my presentation with you. It would give me a chance to identify any weak points or gaps. That serves me right for giving you so much sound advice. No, I was only joking, honey. I'd really love you to practice your presentation on me. Comprehension Why has Kate prepared her presentation carefully? Kate has prepared her presentation well because she wants to make a good impression on the management of United Chocolate. According to Carlos, what is the key to success in a presentation? According to Carlos, good preparation is the key to success of a presentation. Why does Kate feel she has a good grasp of her subject? Kate feels she has a good grasp of her subject because she has worked very hard on her market survey. How did she go about organizing her points? She started by brainstorming her ideas and then she selected the most relevant and appropriate ones. Apart from repeating her main points, how does Kate intend to present her recommendations? She will focus on developing some key points in an interesting and varied way. What do visual aids bring to a presentation? They can make a presentation more attractive and easier to understand. What mistake do people commonly make when they use visual aids? They tend to make them too complicated. As a result, the audience has a tendency to watch them rather than to listen to the speaker. What does Kate tend to do when she is under stress? What should she do about it? When she is under stress, Kate tends to speak too fast. She should pay attention to this and stick to the vocabulary she is familiar with. Why should Kate's presentation be good? Her presentation should be good because she is enthusiastic and she is interested in her subject. What does Kate ask Carlos to do? Kate asks Carlos to be the audience for a rehearsal of her presentation. Chapter 22 At the Bank Kate has been given a few days off before taking up her new position as personal assistant to Russ Kingman, UC's Vice President, Marketing and Sales, in Philadelphia. She is driven down to Nuevo Laredo 
a Mexican town situated close to the U.S. border. As she is walking in the town, she meets a stranded Slovenian student in front of the local branch of an American bank. He asks her help. Good Lord. The bank is closed and I badly need some cash. Do you know where I could cash my traveler's checks? Perhaps you could go to a bureau de change or maybe a big hotel. I can't see one nearby. Besides, some hotels are reluctant to do it if you're not a customer. And I can't expect this type of service from the youth hostel where I'm staying. Well, you could go to a shop and buy something and pay for it with a traveller's cheque. And end up with a trinket I don't need. I'm a student and I'm on a tight budget. In other words, I've got to cut corners if you see what I mean. I do. I'm an art student and I'm not very comfortable with figures. Do you have a debit card? Of course. In that case, why don't you try the ATM? The what? The ATM, automatic teller machine. The cash point, if you prefer. Of course, it will cost you a little more than if you changed your euros at the bank. Yes, I can expect to pay some additional charges, but in times of hardship, one has to make the best of a bad job. Okay, here's my Slovenian card. Let me have a look at it. Yes, it's a Visa card. The machine will accept it. Too bad. The only two languages which are offered are Spanish and English. It'll have to be English. It says, enter your PIN. What is that supposed to mean? You see, I don't speak Spanish and I'm not very fluent in English, especially when it comes to business vocabulary. I would hardly consider the word PIN as business vocabulary. PIN means personal identification number. In other words, you have to punch in your secret code number. Now what? You don't want to deposit or put money in. Select cash withdrawal. How much money do you want? The equivalent of 100 euros. But as I said, I'm not very good at arithmetic. That should keep you going for quite a while. Now, key in that amount. I hope you're not overdrawing. That's okay. I have an overdraft facility of 500 euros to help me get through hard times. But I don't intend to use it. In fact, it's wrong to believe that banks allow you to overdraw for free. Borrowing on overdraft costs money. Now, press confirm, and bingo, here comes your money. Don't forget your receipt. Thanks for your help. I don't know what I would have done without you. Don't worry, we all have to learn. Actually, this is the bank where I have my current account, and I know it quite well. Comprehension Where does this dialogue take place? This dialogue takes place in front of the local branch of an American bank in a Mexican border town called Nuevo Laredo. What is the student's problem? The student needs cash, but the bank is closed. What solutions does Kate suggest? 
Kate suggests to the student that he should cash his traveler's checks in a hotel or buy something and pay with a traveler's check. Why does the student think the hotel is not a good solution? The student says hotels are reluctant to cash traveler's checks for people who are not customers. Why does the student not want to buy something from a shop? The student does not want to buy something he does not need. What solution does the student finally accept? He agrees to use his debit card to withdraw money from an ATM. What is the drawback of that solution? The student will probably have to pay additional charges. What steps must the student follow to get his money? He has to put his card into the machine, enter his PIN number, key in the amount of cash he wants, and press Confirm. Why does Kate consider it is wrong to believe banks offer free overdraft facilities? In her words, borrowing on overdraft costs money. Why does Kate know the bank very well? She knows the bank very well because she has a current account there. Chapter 23 Appointments Kate proceeds with her busy career woman's life as personal assistant to Russ Kingman in Philadelphia. She briefly sees her boss before he goes to one of his many appointments. What's wrong, Kate? I've just had Victoria Carter on the phone. Oh, yes, Victoria Carter, the notorious consumerist activist. She'd like to interview you. I checked in your diary. You have quite a lot of commitments. I rescheduled your appointment with Walter Nacy because he is quite flexible. I think you'd better humour Victoria Carter. I thought Friday at 11.30am would be a convenient time, and perhaps you could have lunch together afterwards. Phooey. Go to a vegetarian restaurant and drink water. Actually, I found her very pleasant on the phone. We'll see about that. Do you happen to know when our distributor in Buenos Aires will be in California? Mr. Ocampo, yes, he gave me a call yesterday afternoon. He's planning to come to our factory in two weeks, so you'll be able to talk to him yourself. When is he coming exactly? On Tuesday 24th. Good. I'm leaving for Paris on Wednesday 25, so that gives me a free day before I leave. By the way, you must have your sales figures ready before the board meeting next week. As a matter of fact, I'd like to have them ready by Friday afternoon so I can look at them over the weekend. You mean get it done yesterday? No. Get it done the day before yesterday. But I'm sure you can do that. I'll do my best. And I'd also like to read your report on the trade fair you went to last week. The San Francisco trade fair? Yes. Oh, I almost forgot. Have you been in touch with Jerry Dixon, our new star salesperson? 
He phoned me yesterday. He's back tomorrow afternoon, so you should be able to see him. I'm scheduled to have lunch with the manager of a new advertising agency. Small wonder you started to develop a paunch. Ah, thank you. That's always nice to hear. <laughs> I'll see Jerry afterwards. I hope he won't be delayed. Traffic is sometimes very bad in Philadelphia. Let's say 4.30 p.m. Could you call him on his cell phone? Could you also be there too, do you think? You haven't got anything on tomorrow, have you? Just a report and sales figures to prepare for my beloved boss? <laughs> that shouldn't be any problem, then. Comprehension What image of Victoria Carter does Russ Kingman have? Russ Kingman has a rather negative image of Victoria Carter. He sees her as a notorious consumer activist. Why did Kate reschedule Walter Nacy's appointment? Kate rescheduled Walter Nacy's appointment because she feels Russ Kingman should make a point of seeing Victoria Carter early in order to humor her. Besides, Walter Nacy is quite flexible. Why is Russ Kingman not very pleased at the prospect of having lunch with Victoria Carter? He is not very pleased because Victoria Carter will probably want to go to a vegetarian restaurant and drink water. Who would Russ Kingman like to see? Russ Kingman would like to see Mr. Ocampo, United Chocolates distributor in Buenos Aires. What assignment does Russ Kingman give to Kate? He asks her to prepare her sales figures for the next board meeting. Why does he give her very short notice? He gives her very short notice because he would like to study her sales figures over the weekend. What else does he want Kate to submit to him? He also asks Kate to submit her report on the San Francisco trade fair to him. Why is Russ Kingman starting to get a paunch? He seems to have business lunches often. Why might Jerry Dixon arrive a bit late at the factory? Jerry might arrive late at the plant because the traffic in Philadelphia is a bit slow at times. Chapter 24 Preparing a Business Trip Kate is very excited because Wes Coiner, the sales director, asked her to call on customers in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. She is preparing her trip with Julia, the marketing department's secretary. Wow, I feel sorry for poor Mr. Coiner. As you know, he broke his ankle while hiking in Yosemite National Park. But his sick leave gives me an opportunity to fly to Kuala Lumpur in his place. Lucky you! But you won't be travelling for pleasure only. No. As a matter of fact, I'm taking this business trip very seriously because I'll be seeing some tough customers in Malaysia. Anyway, whether travelling for business or pleasure, it's always as well to be prepared. Let's start by booking your flight. I don't suppose you want to travel with a low-cost airline. Mr. Coiner told me to travel with a big carrier, although I have no objection to the no-frill service offered by low-cost airlines if necessary. 
It won't be necessary. I found a reasonably priced flight from Philadelphia to Kuala Lumpur. Departure Friday the 10th at 9 p.m. Arrival in Paris on Saturday the 11th at 10.25 a.m. Departure from Paris the same day at 12 noon. Arrival in Kuala Lumpur at 7.25 a.m. on Sunday the 12th. For your return flight, departure from Kuala Lumpur on Friday the 17th at 11.59 p.m. Arrival in Amsterdam at 6.05 a.m. on the 18th. Departure from Amsterdam at 12.50 p.m. Arrival in Philadelphia at 3.40 p.m. the same day. Of course, I would have preferred a direct flight. I don't like to change planes at hubs. But I'm young, and the stopovers in Amsterdam will give me a chance to catch a glimpse of this city. I'll arrange to arrive early at the airport check-in because I want a window seat. And I advise you to choose the exit row or the bulkhead row because they offer more legroom in economy class. By the way, do you have your visa? Yes, I've just got it. Make sure your luggage is not too heavy. UC's finance people might refuse to pay the excess baggage charge. I'm only leaving for five days. And I've learnt to travel light. Good. So now we must find a hotel. Mr. Coiner usually favours chain hotels. I'd rather stay in a centrally located hotel, which has the character that a large chain hotel may lack. Let me see if I can find that kind of hotel. Any hotel will do, as long as it provides business amenities, including copying facilities and a wireless internet connection. Don't expect to find a business centre in the type of hotel you want. I can do without a business centre. The Patna Hotel seems to be a very good prospect. It's conveniently located near the centre, it has character, it provides room service for a quiet dinner after a long day of meetings and presentations. You can even have a queen-sized bed. A single room with a normal bed should be enough. But does the Patna Hotel have a non-smoking floor? Yes, indeed. Will you want to rent a car on arrival? Many rental agencies in Kuala Lumpur offer cars with onboard navigation systems. No, thanks. I prefer to take a taxi. It's much more relaxing. Comprehension Why has Mr. Coiner asked Kate to fly to Kuala Lumpur in his place? Mr. Coiner asked Kate to fly to Kuala Lumpur in his place because he broke his ankle while hiking in Yosemite National Park. How does Kate feel about this trip? Kate feels very excited, but she is taking this trip very seriously. What is Julia's opinion about traveling? Julia feels that whether one travels for business or pleasure, one should be well prepared. What kind of flight does Mr. Corner usually book? Mr. Coiner usually books a flight on a big carrier. What does Kate appreciate about her flight to Kuala Lumpur? Kate appreciates it when there is no change of plane at a hub. What advantage do the exit row and bulkhead row offer an economy class? Both the exit row and the bulkhead row offer more legroom in economy class. Why should Kate's luggage not be overweight? 
if Kate's luggage is too heavy, UC's finance department might refuse to pay the excess baggage charge. Why does Kate prefer a hotel in the center of Kuala Lumpur to a chain hotel? Kate prefers a hotel in the center of Kuala Lumpur to a chain hotel because she thinks the former is likely to have more character. What are Kate's requirements concerning the hotel where she will stay? Kate wants her hotel to be equipped with copying facilities and a wireless internet connection. She also wants to stay on a non-smoking floor. Why does she refuse to rent a GPS-equipped car? Kate refuses to rent a GPS-equipped car because she feels that taking a taxi is more relaxing. Chapter 25 To go shopping or not to go shopping? Kate has some free time before her flight back to the USA. She has been invited for a drink by Bob Jalan, a marketing executive working for one of UC's customers. As Bob has just been appointed to a position in the USA, he has pumped Kate for information. Now, Kate wants him to answer her questions about Malaysia, and more particularly, about shopping. It would be easy to go on a spending spree in Kuala Lumpur. I want to resist the temptation, but I'd like to take a few souvenirs or clothes home. As we say, simply let your hair down and your purse strings loose. <laughs> There's something for everyone. If you were here during the mega sale carnival period, you'd be knocked off your feet when shopping because of the amazingly low prices. Really? Yes. Anyway, for people visiting my country, it appears that shopping is a must. Very few of them go back home empty-handed. I've had a very quick look at the shops in Kuala Lumpur, and I'm amazed by the variety of goods available. They range from sophisticated high-tech equipment to designer fashion clothes. The city seems to be a very popular shopping destination. It rivals Hong Kong and Singapore with its shopping malls. If you have time, be sure to go to Surya KLCC. It has a spectacular fountain, gardens, and a beautiful piazza and... Oh, I almost forgot. It houses a great selection of leading haute couture outlets. Sounds tempting. And you can also find knickknacks in the jam-packed lanes. I suppose bargaining is expected in the markets. It is, unless fixed prices are displayed. But that's unlikely. Are you adventurous, Kate? Up to a point. Then try your hand at bargaining in the little shops. Use your bargaining skills in Chinatown. There's a host of stalls offering the most incredible range of goods. I'd love to give it a try, but I only have a few hours left before my flight. I know it's fun to haggle over a price, but it takes a lot of time. You know, the heated discussion, the feigned indignation, the reversible resolutions and all the hogwash. <laughs> True. It's not for herd people, but you'll miss an interesting cultural experience. If you have just a little leisure time, I advise you to see some of the parks and gardens of the city. You'll be mesmerized by the beauty and fragrant perfume of their flowers. I'm struck by the fact that although Kuala Lumpur is a very modern city with lots of skyscrapers, there are so many nice fragrances that one can't find in Europe or North America. 
There are also old colonial buildings that are well preserved. Talking about tastes and smells, I've enjoyed so much tasting your delicious local fruits and the Malaysian cuisine. Yes, visitors usually appreciate our cuisine very much. I should take a stroll in a park to work off the calories. Why not? But Malaysian cooking is not supposed to be fattening. Anyway, I could use some exercise, and I can buy handcrafted souvenir items for my family from the duty free shop at the airport. I'm sure you'll find wooden jewelry boxes there, kitchen utensils made of bamboo, colorful purses made of beads. And for once, I'll forget the clothes. I already have so many. Comprehension. Why does Bob want Kate to tell him about the USA? Bob would like Kate to tell him about the USA because he would like to have some information about the country where he has been offered a job. What temptation does Kate want to resist? Kate would like to resist the temptation to go on a spending spree in Kuala Lumpur. What is the best time to go shopping in Kuala Lumpur? The best time to go shopping in Kuala Lumpur seems to be the Mega Sale Carnival, which is held there each year. How does Kate think she'll be using her spare time before the flight? Kate may spend her spare time shopping in Kuala Lumpur, but she is undecided. What seems to characterize people who visit Kuala Lumpur? The people who visit Kuala Lumpur usually go home after purchasing a lot of items in the city. Why is Surya, KLCC, an interesting place for a tourist? Surya KLCC is an interesting place for a tourist because it has a lot to offer a spectacular fountain, gardens, and a beautiful piazza, not to mention leading haute couture outlets. What must a tourist shopping in Chinatown be prepared to do? A tourist shopping in Chinatown must be prepared to spend a lot of time haggling over prices. According to Bob, what is also fascinating in Kuala Lumpur? According to Bob, the beauty and the fragrant perfume of Kuala Lumpur's gardens and parks are also fascinating. Why does Kate want to take a stroll in a city park? Kate wants to take a stroll in a city park because she thinks she has eaten too many Malaysian dishes and she would like to work off the calories. What did she decide to buy in Kuala Lumpur? She decided to buy handcrafted souvenirs in the duty free shop at Kuala Lumpur Airport. Chapter 26 A social event. A wine tasting party. The Bear Flag Club, a wine appreciation society within United Chocolate, has organized a wine tasting party on the theme Wines from the Old World and Wines from the New World. When it's over, Kate chats with Marley's Bears, the enologist who spoke about the wines. I loved the tasting and I really appreciated your comments, Marlies. You used very simple words and made the world of wine accessible to all of us. Thank you. It's better to forget to be a snob when you taste wine. What matters is the pleasure you get. 
I've already met connoisseurs who would have you believe that you need a PhD in wine appreciation to be allowed to taste. Small wonder young people turn to beer or harder stuff like whiskey, vodka or tequila. There's no need to be an expert to enjoy wine. As long as you are prepared to take a little trouble to let your eyes, your nose and your palate fulfill their natural process, you can enjoy wine as an amateur, happy to enjoy the good things in life. I also appreciated the pleasure of good company, of exchanging impressions on the... Let me look at the notes I jotted down in my little notebook. Refined, spicy fragrance of the Rheingau Riesling. The great power and finesse of white burgundy. The spicy, spirited treat of Napa Valley Zinfandel. The gooseberry flavours of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Or the excellent, rich, blackcurranty Cabernet from the Aconcagua Valley in Chile. It's a good idea to take notes. They should help you acquire a varied wine-tasting vocabulary and develop your sensorial memory. Unfortunately, one doesn't become a wine taster overnight. Right, it's an exercise in humility. Believe me, when there is a blind tasting, my guesses are often erroneous. But you keep learning. Yes, and I love tasting. Unfortunately, there is no single model of wine, as they say, to serve as a yardstick. Taste in wine, as in art, has to be learnt. I was interested in the distinction you made between the old world and the new world. The old world, France in particular, is attached to tradition. A rich history has crucially influenced the extraordinary wines of a region like Burgundy, for example, whereas the New World has readily embraced modern technology and modern marketing techniques. Do you think that in the future, mechanisation will become more widespread? Undoubtedly. An entire vintage can now be programmed in advance and then simply monitored. The production costs of large New World companies are therefore comparatively low. While mechanisation does not give the most exciting wines, it can at least ensure that they will be relatively fault-free. The wine industry of some European regions, which produce large quantities but have not embraced modernity, is poised at a critical turning point. Keep the customer satisfied. <laughs> Mullies... What lies ahead for the wine industry? Basically, a two-tier system. On the one hand, industrial wineries will keep producing decent, if unexceptional, wines. On the other hand, wine growers in privileged sites will keep making outstanding wines. What a depressing development. Let me finish. I also hope there will continue to be large companies in the old world as well as in the new world who successfully meet the challenge of making large volumes at a high quality level. By the way, I understand you are South African and you haven't spoken of your country. For one thing, I wouldn't include the Rainbow Nation in the new world. After all, our wine industry is over 340 years old. South Africa produces some excellent wines, like those made in Constantia or Stellenbosch. Besides, foreign investment and expertise is helping to set a positive course. Comprehension Why did Kate appreciate Marley's comments? Kate appreciated Marlies's comments because she used simple words. She felt that Marlies made the world of wine accessible to all participants. What attitude characterises some connoisseurs? Some connoisseurs have a snobbish attitude. They consider that only connoisseurs should taste wine. As a result, young people are turning away from wine and prefer drinking beer, 
whiskey, vodka or tequila. What matters when you taste wine? What matters when you taste wine is the enjoyment you get by keeping your eyes, your nose and your palate alert. What else is enjoyable in a wine tasting? The company and the discussion about the wines are also enjoyable. Why is a good command of wine tasting difficult? A good command of tasting is difficult because it is an art that cannot be mastered overnight. It is also an exercise in humility because one is often wrong in one's guesses. What difference did Marley's make between the old world and the new world? The old world is attached to history and tradition, whereas the new world resorts to state-of-the-art technology and modern marketing techniques. What is the effect of mechanisation on the quality of wine? It enables producers to make unexciting, but relatively fault-free wines. How does Marley's see the future of the wine industry? According to Marley's, there will be, on the one hand, industrial wineries which will produce standardised wines, and on the other hand, small wine growers who will produce outstanding, expensive wines in privileged regions. Why is she not really pessimistic? Marlies is not really pessimistic because she believes some large companies, in the old world as well as in the new world, will sell large volumes at a high quality level. According to Marlies, what are the assets of South African viticulture? South African viticulture is not very recent because it is 340 years old. Some excellent wines are produced in Constantia and Stellenbosch, and foreign investment and expertise contribute to raising its standards. Chapter 27 A tour of the company for a major customer. Mr. Ocampo, a major customer from Argentina, is currently visiting UC's headquarters in Philadelphia. During his stay, Kate takes him to San Antonio and shows him around the factory down there. Hmm. The air is filled with the sweet smell of chocolate. Nice, isn't it? Here is the bay where the sacks of cocoa beans are unloaded. They are then emptied into a chute and cleaned. And here you can see the large ovens in which they are roasted. A major stage in developing a good chocolate flavour, no doubt. You mean a fundamental one? When it's finished, the brittle roasted beans are then cracked open. Jets of air are used to separate the shell from the centre of the cocoa beans, known as the nib. This operation is called winnowing. Isn't it similar to the process found in flour making, where the lighter material is blown away while the heavier substance falls through the air jet? A very relevant comparison indeed. Afterwards, the nib is ground to make the liquid known as cocoa mass. Mm. And what happens next? The cocoa mass is mixed with cocoa sugar and extra cocoa fat to make dark or plain chocolate. The mixture is made into a smooth paste by passing through refining rollers. For milk chocolate, the milk is added before the mixture is put into the refining rollers. This stage is called conching. How long is the conching stage? 
We stir plain and dark chocolate in the conching machine for up to two days. With milk chocolate, the conching period is shorter. Two days. I'm impressed. Now I understand why your chocolate has such a smooth, silky texture. The finished chocolate is pumped to a heated storage tank. Before being used, it is taken through a cooling and heating cycle called tempering to make sure it sets with an attractive glossy surface. What about this moulding line? It produces our pecan pralines. We are big consumers of delicious Louisiana pecan nuts. And now the final stage, packing and wrapping. As soon as the chocolate is cooled, it is wrapped in a suitable foil, film or other packaging to keep it fresh. I find UC's packaging colourful and attractive. We're quite pleased with it. Of course, it also gives the product's name and such details as ingredients, weight and how long it will keep. I understand your facility is open to the public. Yes, all year round. This factory, in which we produce one million pounds of chocolate a day, is a popular destination for the whole family with its thrilling attractions, luxurious accommodations and plenty to do all year round. Please be sure to tell your customers to visit us soon. How could they resist tasting so many mouth-watering treats? Comprehension What makes Mr. Ocampo pleased at the beginning of his tour of the company? The sweet smell of chocolate in the air makes Mr. Ocampo pleased at the beginning of his tour of the company. What happens to the cocoa beans once they have been unloaded? Once they have been unloaded, the cocoa beans are emptied into a chute and cleaned. What does winnowing consist in? Winnowing consists in separating the shell from the center of the cocoa beans with jets of air. How does the mixture of cocoa mass, cocoa sugar, and extra fat become a smooth paste? The mixture of cocoa mass, cocoa sugar, and extra cocoa fat becomes a smooth paste by passing through refining rollers. When is the milk in milk chocolate added? The milk in milk chocolate is added before cocoa mass, cocoa sugar, and extra cocoa fat are put into the refining rollers. According to Mr. Ocampo, what accounts for the smooth, silky texture of UC's chocolate? According to Mr. Ocampo, the fact that plain and dark chocolate are stirred for up to two days in the conching machine accounts for the smooth, silky texture of UC's chocolate. What is the purpose of tempering? Tempering aims at making sure that the chocolate sets with an attractive, glossy surface. Where does UC find its pecan nuts? UC buys its pecans in the state of Louisiana. What information to the consumer is conveyed by UC's packaging? Information about the ingredients used, the weight, and how long the chocolate will keep are conveyed by UC's packaging. Why is UC's plant a popular destination for families? UC's plant is a popular destination for families because the company offers thrilling attractions, luxurious accommodations, 
and plenty to do all year round. Chapter 28 Meeting a Journalist Kate is giving an interview to Mike Rowe, a student who is studying towards an MBA in communication. He is writing a series of articles about the work performed in companies by the university's alumni for The Exponent, the student's newspaper. I understand Mr. Kingman was not too keen on allowing you to grant me an interview. You know, media coverage is a double edged sword. Mr. Kingman is very worried about anything that could affect UC's image. Even an article in a student paper. Don't worry, the exponent is not a muckraker. Well, to start with, could you give me some background information about UC? The company was founded by Samuel Marquette, the seventh son of a savvy milk farmer who had emigrated from his beautiful native province of Quebec to Prairie du Chien in the state of Wisconsin. America's Dairyland. Right. Samuel Marquette started manufacturing milk chocolate in 1908. During World War I, the government recognized chocolate's worth as both nourishment and a morale booster to soldiers fighting in France. Our wily founder managed to land a contract with the U.S. Army and supplied the troops with milk chocolate. I assume Samuel Marquette's company kept growing. Yes, it managed to thrive during the Depression and it was incorporated in 1953 after Samuel Marquette's death. Thanks to technological modernization, strategically astute acquisitions, and continued new product development, I'm happy to say the company grew dramatically. The headquarters was moved to Philadelphia. By the way, when did the San Antonio plant open? In 1969. Unfortunately, the chocolate industry didn't escape the effects of the recession of the early 1990s, which was characterized by major restructuring, layoffs, mergers and consolidations, plant closures, and advertising budget cuts. Sales dropped. How did you see weather the storm? Mainly by diversifying its product base. For instance, UC launched several cocoa beverage products. Also, we benefited from the demand for chocolate in new markets such as China, Russia, and other emerging economies. Have consumer tastes changed? Yes, consumers have become health conscious. The sales of our light candies, light desserts, and fat free chocolate items have skyrocketed since the mid 1990s. No one will deny that chocolate is good for people's morale, but is it really good for people's health? Chocolate contains beneficial components such as calcium, magnesium, and copper. Besides, short term preliminary studies have suggested that consumption of products containing chocolate may provide cardiovascular benefits. What about caffeine? The small amount of caffeine present in chocolate occurs in the cocoa beans, unlike the caffeine in soft drinks, which is added during the manufacturing process. I can also tell you that UC provides the nutritional information on its products to help customers balance their diet. We like to hear from our customers and know what they think about our products. Reports are circulating about the risk of a shortage of cocoa and an increase in prices. Is that risk grounded? I haven't looked into my crystal ball. But I can assure you that UC has adopted technological solutions to increase efficiency and lower production costs. 
Okay. Now, a general question. How many people does UC employ? UC employs 9,000 people worldwide, and it is present in 14 countries. We export our products to over 70 countries worldwide. And my last question will be, how do students apply for a temporary or a permanent job at UC? You can tell them to visit www.unitedchocolatejobs.com to access information on career opportunities. Comprehension Why was Mr. Kingman not too keen on the interview? Mr. Kingman was not too keen on the interview because he is worried that a negative article might tarnish UC's image. In what circumstances did Samuel Marquette experience his first business success? Samuel Marquette experienced his first major business success when he managed to land a contract with the U.S. Army during World War I. What factors accounted for the company's steady growth? The factors accounting for UC's steady growth are unceasing technological modernization, strategic <coughs> acquisitions, and continued new product development. What were the effects of the recession of the early 1990s on the chocolate industry? The effects of the recession of the early 1990s on the chocolate industry were major restructuring of the industry, layoffs, mergers and consolidations, plant closures, advertising budget slashes, and plummeting sales. How did UC face the recession? UC reacted to the crisis by diversifying its product base. For instance, by introducing several cocoa beverage products. What changes in consumer behavior since the mid-1990s has UC recorded? Consumers have become more health conscious. They buy more light and fat-free chocolate products. Why is the presence of caffeine in UC's products not a health hazard, according to Kate? According to Kate, the small amount of caffeine present in UC's products occurs in cocoa beans, but no caffeine is added to UC's products. How was UC prepared to face the risk of a cocoa shortage and an increase in cocoa prices? UC has already adopted technological solutions to increase its efficiency and reduce its production costs. What should students interested in a job at UC do? Students interested in a job at UC should visit UC's website, www.unitedchocolatejobs.com, to access information on career opportunities. Chapter 29 The Guangzhou Trade Fair Amy Zhu, a Chinese-American in the marketing department, has been working very hard on the preparation of UC's participation in the Guangzhou Trade Fair. She informs Kate about her plans. I may have already attended trade shows. I may know what they're about, but planning and managing the process is a completely different animal. Yes, it is a big responsibility. Trade shows are one of the best ways to meet a large number of our customers and prospects in a relatively short period of time. I'm fully aware that UC's participation in the Guangzhou Trade Fair is supposed to help us create that all-important first impression. I am confident that it will open the door for future contracts. 
a door that it may be difficult to get our foot into. Come on, it's worth the effort. Our management would not invest in it if they did not expect to get dividends. And our competitors could take advantage of our absence. I would like our first participation to be successful. Have the goals been set right? The marketing department has spent a lot of time thinking about the reasons why we are exhibiting, the target audience, the message we want to convey, what we want to get out of the show. Will our booth look nice? Determining what it should look like was quite tricky. In the end, we opted for a 15-foot size that can be easily shipped, assembled, and disassembled by our booth staffers. Is our staff ready? We are sending our most people-oriented representatives. They know the company inside out. They are enthusiastic, full of energy. They are good listeners. And you'll be coaching them. After all, you are the local girl. You could put it like that. It's true that I was born near Guangzhou, but I left China when I was just a little baby. They all know we want to build brand awareness in China. They are fully informed about our competitors, and they know the competitive advantages of our products. What new products will we present? Chocolate infused with tea. The Earl Grey flavored chocolates are simply delicious, and those flavored with green tea are very good too. Have you already done a pre-show mail shot? Yes, and we won't overload visitors with expensive literature that they will just throw in the trash. We have decided to stick to a well-made economical overview leaflet. You're right. The fair involves a considerable marketing investment. We'll have to pay for space rental, display design, travel, accommodation, promotional literature, and items to give to attendees. In addition, there are the costs incurred at the fair for electric power, booth cleaning, internet services, and also drayage. A big investment, no doubt. But the team should make some good contacts. Our representatives will send them letters addressing their requests. The letters will include a specific offer that should encourage the contact to get back to us. I don't see why you should worry, Amy. You've done your best, and I'm sure the trade show will be successful. Thank you for listening to me. I guess I needed to be reassured. Comprehension Why is Amy worried about the Guangzhou trade fair? Amy is worried about the Guangzhou trade fair because she feels there is a big gap between what she knows about trade fairs and their actual organization. What benefit can UC draw from its participation in the Guangzhou trade fair? UC can expect to contact potential customers and break into the Chinese market. Why has UC's management decided to participate in the fair? UC's management has decided to participate in the Guangzhou trade fair because it is likely to be a good investment and also because it does not want to let its competitors take advantage of its absence to break into the Chinese market. How did UC's marketing department set about preparing the fair? UC's marketing department spent a lot of time devising its participation. How were the staff members participating in the trade fair selected? 
The staff members, who are the most people-oriented, the most familiar with the company, enthusiastic, energetic, and also good listeners, were selected. What were they briefed about? They were briefed about UC's competitors and the competitive advantages of UC's products. What new products will UC present to its visitors at the fair? UC will present chocolates infused with various kinds of tea, Earl Grey and green tea, among others. What kind of literature will UC make available to its visitors? UC will hand out a well-done but economical overview leaflet. What costs will UC incur at the Guangzhou Trade Fair? UC will incur considerable costs, such as space rental, display design, travel, accommodation, promotional literature, and items to give to visitors, not to mention electric power, booth cleaning, and internet services, and also drayage. Why did Amy want to speak to Kate? Amy wanted to be reassured. Chapter 30 Getting the Marketing Mix Right As well as continuing to act as personal assistant to Russ Kingman, Kate has now been officially appointed as product executive for the new pecan praline bar, christened Amigo. It's 8.30 p.m. at UC's headquarters in Philadelphia. Kate and Russ have been working after hours. Before leaving the office, Russ produces a bottle of bourbon which was stashed away in the bottom drawer of his desk. How about a glass of whiskey, Kate? A small one, then, and it's not for the sake of drink. But for the sake of company. <laughs> well, Kate, we now have a difficult decision to make concerning the price of our Amigo bars. I'm all in favor of cost-oriented pricing. Our costs must set the floor for the price you seek and ask for Amigo bars. We want to charge a price that covers all the costs for producing, distributing, and selling the product, plus a fair return on our investment. It's only fair to add a markup to our costs. It's not as simple as that, though. Agreed. We cannot avoid setting our prices on the basis of our competitors' prices. Rather than our costs and revenues. Indeed. Our main competitors set the standard for price decisions in the entire industry. Nevertheless, I hope we'll do better than break even. Of course. It's always difficult to know what prices our competitors charge. Although their information is closely guarded, I managed to get a look at their figures. They may not be informative, though, because the actual prices are established through negotiation. Yes, indeed. I see what you mean when you say that the task of setting a price is not easily tackled. I realize that. But allow me to repeat myself. We must also try to offer competitive prices whilst making some profit. I'm fairly confident. Don't we pay a lot of attention to cost control? Of course, we could still do better. We still have to streamline and simplify operations. <laughs> that sounds very much like old Dan Bush, our dear finance director. Come on, Russ. Be serious for a while. You know that UC is a thrifty shopper, and our buyers certainly know how to ferret out cheap pecan nuts and squeeze supplies for extra savings. NAFTA is good for us. Pecan nuts are cheaper in Mexico. 
we have no customs duties to pay on them. Texas and Louisiana pecan producers would surely be delighted to hear you. By the way, are you sure you want to make a career in marketing? If I were old Dan Bush, I would get worried. Stop kidding me, Russ. You know it would be foolish to overlook chances to economize. Lower costs mean lower prices, and lower prices mean greater profits. Of course, Kate. I was just teasing you. Where did you leave your sense of humor? Comprehension. Do Russ and Kate work according to a strict schedule at UC? No, they seem to be used to working after hours. What is Kate's first idea about a pricing policy for Amigo bars? She would like the price of Amigo bars to do better than cover the cost of producing them. How does she justify her opinion? She thinks it's only fair for UC to be rewarded for its efforts in the field of research, production, promotion, and distribution. What other pricing policy factors should be taken into account? Competitors' prices cannot be ignored in the highly competitive environment of chocolate bars. What type of information about the competition does Russ Kingman find difficult to obtain? Information about competitors' prices is very difficult to obtain. Why do price lists provide unreliable information? Actual prices, which are determined through negotiation, are different from the prices mentioned in price lists. Why is Kate hopeful that UC will do better than break even with Amigo bars? Because UC has managed to reduce costs to a minimum. What does Kate reveal about UC's buying policy? UC buyers seem to have a knack for buying products cheaply. Why does NAFTA offer interesting opportunities for UC? Because the cost of pecan nuts is lower in Mexico, and UC will be able to import them without having to pay duties. Why would Texas and Louisiana pecan producers not be pleased to hear Kate? As the prices they charge are higher than those charged by their Mexican competitors, they are likely to lose market share. Chapter 31 Contacting an Advertising Agency Kate has invited Alan Carr, the customer service manager of a leading advertising firm, for a briefing session, in the course of which she defines the product, the objectives, the means, and the deadlines for the Amigo Bar advertising campaign. Needless to say, I hope we'll become real partners. I must admit, it is quite interesting to develop an advertising campaign with an agency. We pretty much know what we want, and we'd rely on you for copywriting, artwork, technical production, and formulation of the media plan. First, we would need to define our advertising objectives in clear, precise, and measurable terms. As far as we're concerned, we want to break into the Hispanic market with our Amigo bars. We would like to sell 30 million of them within a year. That's certainly an ambitious goal. We wouldn't have considered working with you if we hadn't thought you were able to help us meet it. 
Success comes at a price. We don't want to squander our financial resources. Conversely, we are willing to make every effort to budget enough money so that our program can achieve its advertising and marketing objectives. As a matter of fact, instead of paying the traditional 15% commission on media and production billing, we prefer to lower the commission to 13% and we pay bonuses of up to 5% if you do outstanding work. To be quite honest, I'm not surprised by your proposal. More and more clients are tying their ad agency's compensation to performance. This point is negotiable. If we work well together, we'll be able to create the message you wish to communicate to the target market. This report contains the selling features of pecan praline bars to be stressed in the program. Have you mentioned the important features that the competitors' products don't have? Of course. We expect the agency to find words, symbols and illustrations that are meaningful, familiar and attractive to the people, mostly Hispanics, who make up our target market. Obviously, we would have to work on a concise, simple message for outdoor displays, you know. Billboards, announcements for radio stations and so on. What about magazine and newspaper advertisements? They can include just a little more detail and longer explanations as long as they grab the reader's attention. Does your agency work fast? Yes, we are known for our speed. Our artistic director and our copywriters are all very, very good. They could come up with roughs very soon. I could submit the first drafts to you within a week. All right. I suggest we meet again to examine them and possibly discuss the media plan. Comprehension Why does Alan Carr hope to become UC's true partner? Because it would mean his agency would get the contract and develop a program with UC. What does Kate expect from an advertising agency? She expects the advertising agency to take care of the advertising campaign and media plan. What is a major advantage of working on the Amigo Bar campaign? The objective, however ambitious it may seem, is clearly defined. What shows that Kate has a lot of confidence in Alan Carr's company? She would not have gotten in touch with him if she had not thought his agency was able to take up the challenge. Why does Kate suggest lowering the commission and offering a bonus for outstanding work? She thinks it will motivate the agency more. What is the purpose of the report prepared by Kate? As the agency selected will work with UC, it is important to communicate a lot of information to them. The advertising campaign must be consistent with UC's strategy. What aspect of the report is Alan Carr especially interested in? He is interested in the competitive advantages of Amigo Bars. What media have Alan Carr and Kate considered using? They have considered outdoor displays, radio, magazines, and newspapers. What media have they failed to consider using? They have failed to consider television. What is the process used by UC in order to select an advertising agency? 
you see must have studied the performances of different companies and selected those whose creative approach it thinks is suited to Amigo bars. It has invited them for a briefing session. The agencies interested will submit their proposals to UC, who will decide whom the project will be assigned to. Chapter 32 Quality Control Kate has an appointment with Torlev Bilstadt, UC's Norwegian-born quality control manager, to take stock of the Amigo production process. He's showing her the new production line at the San Antonio factory. Well, Torlev, the production workers seem satisfied. As a matter of fact, they don't complain. This brand new production line gives all of us an ideal opportunity to start with a clean sheet. Our facilities encourage greater efficiency in a pleasant working environment. Management wanted the workers to be well catered for, with nice offices, laboratories, locker and laundry rooms, canteen facilities for all. Torlev, is the quality of Amigo bars up to standard? Yes. It meets our expectations. That is a compliment from the gods. I have often heard about your Viking perfectionism. You know, in Norway, people consider that every single detail is of the utmost importance. I agree with you, up to a point. I mean, insofar as it doesn't hamper operating efficiency. As the latest technology is incorporated in a logical sequence in this plant, economy of operation is ensured. This production line represents a carefully scheduled combination of human skill and experience with high technology and automation. What task does this machine perform? This five-roller grinder ensures that the refining will give the cocoa its sharpness. How fine is the powder? The ideal diameter of particles is 15 to 25 microns. What happens if you don't obtain that size? If it's bigger, the chocolate has a sandy texture. If it's smaller, it sticks to the palate. Is it the only quality control problem you have to deal with? Crystallization is no easy matter either. We heat the chocolate to a temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit for 72 hours and let it cool down in very gradual stages so as to obtain fine, stable crystals. The process has to be long drawn out. Failing this, the chocolate blanches. Too bad. We should have designed a white chocolate bar. It would have been easier to manufacture. Kate, would you care for an Amigo? I'm dying for an Amigo. Mmm, it's delicious. But what is the expert's verdict? Nice blackberry colour. Good aromas, determined by a judicious selection of cocoa beans. Cocoa beans roasted at the optimum temperature. The cooling process went smoothly. Harmonious blend of chocolate and pecan nuts. No doubt, this bar should satisfy the most demanding consumer. I've already developed a strong liking for Amigo bars. If I don't pay attention, it will turn into an addiction. How will I manage to keep a slim figure? Comprehension What shows that UC does not trifle with quality? UC has appointed 
a quality control manager who is known for his perfectionism. What were UC's objectives when it built its new production line in the San Antonio plant? It wanted to build a functional, brand new production line which could provide a pleasant working environment for the workers. It also wanted to improve quality by making good use of human resources. Why does Kate give a lot of credit to Torl of Bilstad's opinion? Because Torlev Bilstad is not known for being complacent. According to Kate, what is the danger of perfectionism? If too much attention is paid to detail, operating efficiency may be forgotten, which would be detrimental to the company. Why does Torlev Bilstad think the dangers of perfectionism are limited in the plant? Torlev Bilstadt thinks that UC can pay attention to detail because economy of operation is ensured by the latest technology. What important quality factor has not been overlooked? The human factor, human skill and experience, plays a big part in UC's new production line. Why does the refining quality matter a lot? Because if the size of particles is not up to standard, it affects the taste of chocolate bars. Why must the cooling process be closely monitored? If it is not gradual, the chocolate blanches. What do Torl of Bilstadt's comments on the Amigo bar remind you of? They make us think of wine tasting comments. What is Kate concerned about? Kate is afraid of putting on weight. Chapter 33 Promoting the product. Kate and Dr. Clifford Cutler, who was her advisor at the university, are having an open discussion on the phone about some issues raised by the impending launch of Amigo Bars. So, you've been explaining to me that UC wishes to communicate to its target market positive, persuasive information about its products. You also want to present the message in a language the market can grasp. I think I've seen to that. Hmm, that's a girl. From what I gather, you've been doing a really good job so far. Thanks to your thorough market survey, UC has collected useful data which will be critical in successfully communicating with its target market. I imagine Carlos was able to help you when it came to the Hispanic population. How did you guess? We know what type of information will persuade consumers to buy Amigo Bars. We know who our customers are. We know what information data they use when making purchasing decisions. Which means that UC can now plan, implement, coordinate and control all B2B communication tools. Advertising, sales promotion, personal selling and public relations will of course be the four major elements of your promotion mix. Although feedback from advertising is generally slow, if it occurs at all, we intend to target TV commercials at children during their Saturday morning programs. Thus, we can hope to establish brand loyalty during the early years of their life. Please note that the Dietitians Association is calling for a ban on TV advertising of junk food to kids. Our Amigo bar is no junk food. The dietitians and our research team have seen to that. Besides, a ban would be unworkable. Parents, not government, should decide what children eat. 
Anyway, I don't think food ads on TV are going to disappear anytime soon. As a matter of fact, advertising has less persuasive power over customers than other forms of promotion. I'm aware of that. Face to face communication with potential buyers, such as supermarkets, will be another element of our promotional mix. Because of its one to one nature, personal selling can be very effective. Uh, because it is communication with only one individual, it costs a lot, too. Which is why we will give priority to sales promotion. We will offer retailers, salespersons, and consumers various inducements, such as coupons, sweepstakes, refunds, displays for purchasing Amigo bars. Just think of the thrill of a sweepstake in which consumers could win trips to Cape Kennedy or Disneyland Paris. What about public relations? It will be planned and implemented so that it is compatible with and supportive of the other elements in the promotion mix. I have prepared news releases and encouraged media people to broadcast and print them. Quite a few journalists have been invited to visit our new San Antonio production line. We should have magazine, newspaper, radio, and TV news stories about our new facilities. Will you be ready in time for the launching? We'd better be. We've already started the production tests, and we have to launch Amigo Bars in early September when children go back to school and consumers acquire new habits. By the way, Kate, I have also heard about a flashy idea of yours on the grapevine. What flashy idea? Hot air balloons shaped like Amigo bars. <laughs> It's not a flashy idea, but a high visibility promotional tool, as my favorite marketing professor would say. Comprehension. What useful effects has Kate's market study had? It has enabled UC to know prospective customers' personalities and purchasing behavior, and thus to communicate with this target market successfully. How does UC intend to use the data collected? UC intends to plan, implement, coordinate, and control the various aspects of communication. What is the combination of advertising, sales promotion, personal selling, and public relations called? It is called the promotion mix. Why doesn't Kate believe in a ban on TV advertising of food to kids? Kate thinks a ban on TV advertising of food would be both impractical and unworkable. What is the drawback of TV commercials? They have less persuasive power than people commonly believe. Why is face to face communication with potential buyers usually effective? Because personal relationships are established between seller and buyer. Why will Kate privilege sales promotion? Because it is cheaper. What is a necessary condition to make public relations effective? Public relations must be well integrated into the promotion mix. What public relations actions has Kate prepared? She has prepared news releases for media people and organized guided tours of the new San Antonio production line for newspaper, radio, and TV journalists.